The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde Chapter 13 There is no good way telling me you are going to be good, Dorian, cried Lord Henry, dipping his white fingers into the red copper bowl filled with rose water. You are quite perfect. Pray don't change. Dorian shook his head. No, Harry. I have done too many dreadful things in my life. I am not going to do any more. I began my good actions yesterday. Where were you yesterday? In the country, Harry. I was staying at a little inn by myself. My dear boy, said Lord Henry, smiling, anybody can do good in the country. There are no temptations there. That is the reason why people who live out of town are so uncivilized. There are only two ways, as you know, of becoming civilized. One is by being cultured. The other is by being corrupt. Country people have no opportunity of being either, so they stagnate. Culture and corruption, murmured Dorian. I have known something of both. It seems to me curious now that they should ever be found together. For I have a new ideal, Harry. I am going to alter. I think I have altered. You have not told me what your good action was, or did you say you had done more than one? I can tell you, Harry. It is not a story I could tell to anyone else. I spared somebody. It sounds vain, but you understand what I mean. She was quite beautiful, and wonderfully like Sybil Vane. I think it was that which first attracted me to her. You remember Sybil, don't you? How long ago that seems. Well, Hetty was not one of our own class, of course. She was simply a girl in a village, but I really loved her. I am quite sure that I loved her. All during this wonderful May that we have been having, I used to run down and see her two or three times a week. Yesterday she met me in a little orchard. The apple blossoms kept tumbling down on her hair, and she was laughing. We were to have gone away together this morning at dawn. Suddenly I determined to leave her as flower-like as I had found her. I should think the novelty of the emotion must have given you a thrill of real pleasure, Dorian, interrupted Lord Henry. But I can finish your idol for you. You gave her good advice and broke her heart. That was the beginning of your reformation. Harry, you're horrible. You mustn't say these dreadful things. Hetty's heart is not broken. Of course she cried and all that. But there is no disgrace upon her. She can live like Perdita in her garden. And weep over a faithless florizel, said Lord Henry, laughing. <laughs> My dear Dorian, you have the most curious boyish moods. Do you think this girl will ever be really contented now with anyone of her own rank? I suppose she will be married some day to a rough carter or a grinning ploughman. Well, having met you and loved you, we'll teach her to despise her husband, and she will be wretched. From a moral point of view, I don't really think much of your great renunciation. Even as a beginning, it is poor. Besides, how do you know that Hetty isn't floating at the present moment in some mill-pond, with water lilies round her head, like Ophelia. I can't bear this, Harry. You mock at everything, and then suggest the most serious tragedies. I am sorry I told you now. I don't care what you say to me. I know I was right in acting as I did. Poor Hetty. As I rode past the farm this morning, I saw her white face at the window, like a spray of jasmine. Don't let me talk about it any more, and don't try to persuade me that the first good action I have done for years, the first little bit of self-sacrifice I have ever known, is really a sort of sin. I want to be better. I am going to be better. Tell me something about yourself. What is going on in town? I have not been to the club for days. 
the people are still discussing poor Basil's disappearance. I should have thought they had got tired of that by this time, said Dorian, pouring himself out some wine and frowning slightly. My dear boy, they have only been talking about it for six weeks, and the public are not really equal to the mental strain of having more than one topic every three months. They have been very fortunate lately, however. They have had my own divorce case, and Alan Campbell's suicide. Now they have got the mysterious disappearance of an artist. Scotland Yard still insists that the man in the grey ulster who left Victoria by the midnight train on the 7th of November was poor Basil and French police declare that Basil never arrived in Paris at all. I suppose, in about a fortnight, we will be told that he has been seen in San Francisco. It is an odd thing, but every one who disappears is said to be seen at San Francisco. It must be a delightful city, and possess all the attractions of the next world. What do you think has happened to Basil? asked Dorian, holding up his burgundy against the light, and wondering how it was that he could discuss the matter so calmly. I have not the slightest idea. If Basil chooses to hide himself, it is no business of mine. If he is dead, well, I don't want to think about him. Death is the only thing that ever terrifies me. I hate it. One can survive everything nowadays except that. Death and vulgarity are the only two facts in the nineteenth century that one cannot explain away. Let us have our coffee in the music-room, Dorian. You must play Chopin for me. The man with whom my wife ran away played Chopin exquisitely. Poor Victoria was very fond of her. The house is rather lonely without her. Dorian said nothing, but rose from the table, and, passing into the next room, sat down to the piano, and let his fingers stray across the keys. After the coffee had been brought in, he stopped, and, looking over at Lord Henry, said, "'Harry, did it ever occur to you that Basil was murdered?' Lord Henry yawned. "'Basil had no enemies, and always wore a Waterbury watch.' Why should he be murdered? He was not clever enough to have enemies. Of course, he had a wonderful genius for painting, but a man can paint like Velasquez, and yet be as dull as possible. Basil was really rather dull. He only interested me once, and that was when he told me years ago that he had a wild adoration for you. I was very fond of Basil, said Dorian, with a sad look in his eyes. "'But don't people say that he was murdered?' "'Oh, some of the papers do. "'It does not seem to be probable. "'I know there are dreadful places in Paris, "'but Basil was not the sort of man to have gone to them. "'He had no curiosity. "'It was his chief defect. Uh, "'Play me a nocturne, Dorian, and as you play, "'tell me, in a low voice, how you have kept your youth. "'You must have some secret. "'I am only ten years older than you are, "'and I am wrinkled and bald and yellow. "'You are really wonderful, Dorian. "'You have never looked more charming than you do to-night. "'You remind me of the day I saw you first. "'You are rather cheeky, very shy, and absolutely extraordinary. "'You have changed, of course, but not in appearance. "'I wish you would tell me your secret. "'To get back my youth, I would do anything in the world.' "'except take exercise, get up early, or be respectable. Hmm. "'Youth, there is nothing like it. "'It's absurd to talk of the ignorance of youth. "'The only people whose opinions I listen to now with any respect "'are people much younger than myself. "'They seem in front of me. "'Life has revealed to them her last wonder. "'As for the aged, I always contradict the aged. "'I do it on principle.' If you ask them their opinion on something that happened yesterday, they solemnly give you their opinions current in 1820, when people wore high stocks and knew absolutely nothing. How wonderful that thing you are playing is. I wonder, did Chopin write it in Majorca? With the sea weeping around the villa, and the spray salt dashing against the panes? This is marvellously romantic. 
What a blessing it is that there is one art left to us that is not imitative. No, don't stop. I want music tonight. It seems to me that you are the young Apollo, and I am the young Marsyas, listening to you. I have sorrows, Dorian, of my own, that even you know nothing of. The tragedy of old age is not that one is old, but that one is young. I am amazed sometimes at my own sincerity. Ah, Dorian, how happy you are. What an exquisite life you have had. You have drunk deeply of everything. You have crushed the grapes against your palate. Nothing has been hidden from you. But it has all been to you no more than the sound of music. It has not marred you. You are still the same. I wonder what the rest of your life will be. Don't spoil it by renunciations. At present you are the perfect type. Don't make yourself incomplete. You are quite flawless now. You need not shake your head. You know you are. Besides, Dorian, don't deceive yourself. Life is not governed by will or intention. Life is a question of nerves and fibres and slowly built-up cells in which thought hides itself and passion has its own dreams. You may fancy yourself safe and think yourself strong, but a chance tone of colour in a room or a morning sky... A particular perfume that you had once loved and that brings strange memories with it. A line from a forgotten poem that you had come across again. A cadence from a piece of music that you had ceased to play. I tell you, Dorian, that it is on things like these that our lives depend. Browning writes about that somewhere, but our own senses will imagine them for us. There are moments when the odour of heliotrope passes suddenly across me, and I have to live the strangest year of my life over again. I wish I could change places with you, Dorian. The world has cried out against us both, but it has always worshipped you. It always will worship you. You are the type of what the age is searching for and what it is afraid it has found. I am so glad that you have never done anything, never carved a statue, or painted a picture, or produced anything outside of yourself. Life has been your art. You have set yourself to music. Your days have been your sonnets. Dorian rose from the piano and passed his hand through his hair. Yes, life has been exquisite, he murmured. But I'm not going to have the same life, Harry. And you must not say these extravagant things to me. You don't know everything about me. I think that if you did, even you would turn from me. No, you laugh. <laughs> don't laugh. Why have you stopped playing, Dorian? Go back and play the nocturne over again. Look at that great honey-coloured moon that hangs in the dusky air. She's waiting for you to charm her. And if you play, she will come closer to the earth. You won't? Let us go to the club, then. It has been a charming evening, and we must end it charmingly. There is someone who wants immensely to know you. Young Lord Poole, Bournemouth's eldest son. He has already copied your neckties, and has begged me to introduce him to you. He is quite delightful, and rather reminds me of you. I hope not, said Dorian, with a touch of pathos in his voice. But I am tired tonight, Harry. I won't go to the club. It is nearly eleven, and I want to go to bed early. Do stay. You have never played so well as tonight. There was something in your touch that was wonderful. It had more expression than I have ever heard from it before. It is because I am going to be good, he answered, smiling. I am a little changed already. Don't change, Dorian. At any rate, don't change to me. We must always be friends. Yet you poisoned me with a book once. I should not forgive you that. Harry, promise me that you will never lend that book to anyone. It does harm. My dear boy, 
You are really beginning to moralize. You will soon be going about warning people against all the sins of which you have grown tired. You are much too delightful to do that. Besides, it is no use. You and I are what we are, and will be what we will be. Come round to-morrow. I am going to ride at eleven, and we might go together. The park is quite lovely now. I don't think there have been such lilacs since the year I met you. Very well. I will be here at eleven, said Dorian. Good night, Harry. As he reached the door, he hesitated for a moment, as if he had something more to say. Then he sighed and went out. It was a lovely night, so warm that he threw his coat over his arm, and did not even put his silk scarf round his throat. As he strolled home, smoking a cigarette, two young men in evening dress passed him. He heard one of them whisper to the other, "'That is Dorian Gray.' He remembered how pleased he used to be when he was pointed out, or stared at, or talked about. He was tired of hearing his own name now. Half the charm of the little village where he had been so often lately was that no one knew who he was. He had told the girl whom he had made love him that he was poor, and she had believed him. He had told her once that he was wicked, and she had laughed at him, and told him that wicked people were always very old and very ugly. What a laugh she had! Just like a thrush singing. And how pretty she had been in her cotton dresses and her large hats. She knew nothing, and she had everything that he had lost. When he reached home, he found his servant waiting up for him. He sent him to bed, and threw himself down on the sofa in the library, and began to think over some of the things that Lord Henry had said to him. Was it really true that one could never change? He felt a wild longing for the unstained purity of his boyhood, his rose-white boyhood, as Lord Henry had once called it. He knew that he had tarnished himself, filled his mind with corruption, and given horror to his fancy, that he had been an evil influence to others, and had experienced a terrible joy in being so, and that of the lives that had crossed his own it had been the fairest and most full of promise that he had brought to shame. But was it all irretrievable? Was there no hope for him? It was better not to think of the past. Nothing could alter that. It was of himself and of his own future that he had to think. Alan Campbell had shot himself one night in his laboratory, and had not revealed the secret that he had been forced to know. The excitement, such as it was, over Basil Hallward's disappearance would soon pass away. It was already waning. He was perfectly safe there, nor, indeed, was it the death of Basil Hallward that weighed most upon his mind. It was the living death of his own soul that troubled him. Basil had painted the portrait that had marred his life. He could not forgive him that. It was the portrait that had done everything. Basil had said things to him that were unbearable, and that he had yet borne with patience. The murder had been simply the madness of a moment. As for Alan Campbell, his suicide had been his own act. He had chosen to do it. It was nothing to him. A new life. That was what he wanted. That was what he was waiting for. Surely he had begun it already. He had spared one innocent thing, at any rate. He would never again tempt innocence. He would be good. As he thought of Hetty Merton, he began to wonder if the portrait in the locked room had changed. Surely it was not still so horrible as it had been. Perhaps if his life became pure, he would be able to expel every sign of evil from the face. Perhaps the signs of evil had already gone away. He would go and look. He took the lamp from the table and crept upstairs. As he unlocked the door, a smile of joy flitted across his young face and lingered for a moment about his lips. Yes, he would be good, and the hideous thing that he had hidden away would no longer be a terror to him. 
He felt as if the load had been lifted from him already. He went in quietly, locking the door behind him, as was his custom, and dragging the purple hanging from the portrait. A cry of pain and indignation broke from him. He could see no change, unless that in the eyes there was a look of cunning, and the mouth the curved wrinkle of the hypocrite. The thing was still loathsome, more loathsome, if possible, than before, and the scarlet dew that spotted the hand seemed brighter and more like blood newly spilt. Had it been merely vanity that made him do his one good deed, or the desire of a new sensation, as Lord Henry had hinted with his mocking laugh, or that passion to act a part that sometimes makes us do things finer than we are ourselves, or perhaps all these, why was the red stain larger than it had been? It seemed to have crept like a horrible disease over the wrinkled fingers. There was blood on the painted feet, as though the thing had dripped, blood even on the hand that had not held the knife. Confess? Did it mean that he was to confess, to give himself up and be put to death? He laughed. He felt that the idea was monstrous. Besides, who would believe him, even if he did confess? There was no trace of the murdered man anywhere. Everything belonged to him had been destroyed. He himself had burned what had been below stairs. The world would simply say he was mad. They would shut him up if he persisted in his story. Yet it was his duty to confess, to suffer public shame, and to make public atonement. There was a God who called upon men to tell their sins to earth as well as to heaven. Nothing that he could do would cleanse him till he had told his own sin. His sin? He shrugged his shoulders. The death of Basil Hallward seemed very little to him. He was thinking of Hetty Merton. It was an unjust mirror, this mirror of his soul that he was looking at. Vanity, curiosity, hypocrisy. Had there been nothing more in his renunciation than that? There had been something more, or at least he thought so, but who could tell? And this murder, was it to dog him all his life? Was he never to get rid of the past? Was he really to confess? No. There was only one bit of evidence left against him. The picture itself. That was evidence. He would destroy it. Why had he kept it so long? It had given him pleasure once to watch it changing and growing old. Of late, he had felt no pleasure. It had kept him awake at night. When he had been away, he had been filled with terror lest other eyes should look upon it. It had brought melancholy across his passions. Its mere memory had marred many moments of joy. It had been like conscience to him. Yes, it had been conscience. He would destroy it. He looked around and saw the knife that had stabbed Basil Hallward. He had cleaned it many times, till there was no stain left upon it. It was bright and it glistened. As it had killed the painter, so it would kill the painter's work and all that that meant. It would kill the past, and when that was dead he would be free. He seized it and stabbed the canvas with it, ripping the thing right up from top to bottom. There was a crash heard, and a cry. The cry was so horrible in its agony that the frightened servants woke, and crept out of their rooms. Two gentlemen, who were passing in the square below, stopped and looked up at the great house. They walked on till they met a policeman and brought him back. The man rang the bell several times, but there was no answer. The house was all dark except for a light in one of the top windows. After a time he went away and stood in the portico of the next house and watched. "'Whose house is that, constable?' asked the elder of two gentlemen. "'Mr. Dorian Gray, sir.' They looked at each other as they walked away and sneered. One of them was Sir Henry Ashton's uncle. Inside, in the servants' pot of the house, the half-clad domestics were talking in low whispers to each other. 
old Mrs. Leaf was crying and wringing her hands. Francis was as pale as death. After about a quarter hour, he got the coachman and one of the footmen and crept upstairs. They knocked, but there was no reply. They called out. Everything was still. Finally, after vainly trying to force the door, they got on the roof and dropped down onto the balcony. The windows yielded easily. The bolts were old. When they entered, they found hanging upon the wall a splendid portrait of their master as they had last seen him, in all the wonder of his exquisite youth and beauty. Lying on the floor was a dead man in evening dress, with a knife in his heart. He was withered and wrinkled and loathsome of visage. It was not till they had examined the rings that they had recognized who it was. End of chapter 13 And end of the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde Read by John Gonzales www.johngon.com This has been a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more information, or how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.